Let's listen. That's what it's all about. There's no noise. Street, I used to wander, mm, and I made myself a bed. I'm I'm in my backyard right now, and there's a highway behind somewhere there, and I can hear faintly a car. But that's fundamentally why I hike is to get away from, you know. And I'm lucky because I already live in in the countryside, and I get away from the hustle and bustle. But even with living in the countryside, I still need to get away more. So. That's that's why I hike. It's just so um, so great to be out there to connect with nature, to be to to just hear the sounds and see the scenery and not have a cell phone. That's one thing I absolutely love about our national parks. There's no cell phones. Somebody asked, what goes through my mind while I'm hiking? Uh, lots of things go through my mind. Uh, I think about work sometimes. I think about family. Uh, most of the time, I'm just into the moment. You know, I'm enjoying the hike. Um, but uh, it, it's surprising, actually. You, you get into the moment, and I don't have a lot of deep thoughts. So people might think I have deep thoughts. I, I don't have deep thoughts. I'm just in the moment enjoying the hike. And a lot of times around camp and things like that, there's just too much to do especially when you're alone so you don't have time to sort of just think you know um but at night when you're sitting by the fire yeah you got a lot of time to think by the fire you know you remember other hikes or you just stare in the fire actually uh, an interesting thing for uh i'll say this to the women out there you know my wife will often say what are you thinking about and i'll say nothing and she finds that hard to believe the truth is a lot of times I'm not thinking about anything, you know. Yeah, so people ask, uh, what do I do for a living? Well, I, uh, I went to school and I graduated engineering in the 1990s. I'm uh, from Ontario, but I, there was no jobs in the 1990s, so that's when I moved out west here to Alberta. So I've been living in Alberta since... Uh, Nine, April 1991, so almost 30 years now, and I've worked uh, all my career in the extraction industries. Uh, Alberta is famous for its uh, oil and gas and coal and other resources, so I'm an engineer, professional engineer, chemical engineer, and I've worked in uh, small towns throughout northern Alberta. That's why I picked up the moniker Marty Up North. I used to live up north. People have said, you know, Calgary South. Of, yes, Calgary South. But I've lived as far north as Grand Prairie um, in Alberta. Met my wife in uh, in a place called Edson. And for for about 15 years of my life, I was living up in the north. And I was superintendent. And I had properties that uh, man, that were all the way up to the Northwest Territories. Jesse Manta, Jesse um, from Edmonton, I believe. Jesse asked me if there was anything I wouldn't sacrifice in my quest to uh, my ultralight quest. Um, first of all, it's not necessarily a quest for ultralight. As I modernize gear and I can afford it, I buy lighter gear. Of course, I'm not. I'm not a uh, absolutely on a huge quest, but uh, it's a good question. And, and one thing that I've tried to lighten over the years, and I, I'd say I won't sacrifice on it, is is my boots. I uh, I got injured while playing hockey, and I'd say I have sort of a, a weak ankles. I've twisted my ankles many times over the years, and I've tried shoes, but I just cannot hike in shoes or in light boots. So I'm I've always hiked in leather boots. I'd say uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sacrificing my boots at all. Well, my tent is set up and I have a book. I'm just reading a little bit, lying down here, resting, stretching. Lots of neighbors today. There's uh, three or four other tents in the area here, so. 
Yeah, another common question I get a lot is, uh, do I have any plans of doing long through hikes? And uh, the quick answer is no. Um, you know, through hike, I've been hiking for 35 years. Through hiking was not a big deal way back when. And today, you know, I, I think people have about two or three reasons to want to through hike. One is they're seeking, you know, perhaps they live in a city and they're seeking a long solitude. And uh, I get that anytime I go out here. So I, so I'm not gonna through. I, I don't. I can satisfy my need for solitude elsewhere. Um, the other reason I think maybe I'm generalizing, but people like to through hike for the achievement and I get that and I've achieved a lot of things in my life you know I don't need to brag about having through hike something um, I'm, I have a lot of proud achievements in my life so I don't need to, to through hike for that I certainly don't need to do it to find myself uh, Marty found himself a long long time ago I'm very happy uh, in my skin and in my choices in life you know uh, I'm an engineer a father uh, I've had a successful career and I, and I never struggled trying to find out who I am. But then the third reason is I'm also older and our final reason is I don't through hike because I don't have that commitment of doing 60 days committed to one thing. If I, ha I have time on my hands and if I have 60 days it's not going to be walking a through hike, it's going to be sailing somewhere or it's going to be doing a nice canoe adventure or something that I've not done. So, um, and, and that's the other reality is I enjoy a lot of hobbies, not just hiking. I like canoeing, biking, uh, being with family. So, short answer, no, I'm not through hiking. Sure is gorgeous. Look at this. Hey, uh, no name in particular, lots of people have asked this one. Uh, do I carry a gun? The answer is no for two reasons. The first one is the very pragmatic reason that most of the places we go were not allowed guns. Uh, that's, a, that's just the... Um, Canada is a, has some very strict gun laws and, and the gun that would be easily carried here would be a handgun, for instance, and handguns cannot be carried in uh, public or on public lands. It can only be used at a, at a, um, at a gun range. And the second reason is I, I wouldn't carry a gun anyways because it's too heavy and I don't think it's a, is an appropriate tool for anything that I do. I'm not hunting. Uh, if I was going to hunt, I'd bring a rifle. And as far as self-defense is concerned, I'm not, I'm not worried about other humans. I'd be worried about a bear. And, and I think a gun against the bears is, is uh, um, not the most efficient thing. I'd rather pull out my bear spray. I'd rather avoid the encounter altogether. But no, I, you know, and I don't want... I, I'm glad we don't live in a, a, a country where people are going around with guns uh, in their backpacks. I, I wouldn't want to be hiking... I want to avoid, I, I hike to try and get away from some of the craziness of modern day civilization. So, no, I don't want to hike with guns. Don't hike with guns. Don't want to hike with guns. Don't want to be around people that are hiking with guns. Okay, here's, a, here's another good question. Uh, this one is from uh, Pat Mazur 81 and Pat asks, you know, how to prepare for soloing. Uh, simple, my, my simple uh, answer to that question would be go hiking solo on a popular trail the first time and, only, and commit yourself to just an overnight. So for instance, uh, Evan and I went to uh, Point last weekend or two weekends ago. So hike to Point. There's 20 campsites there. You should be able to find one that's fairly isolated from others. In fact, it's usually the less popular campsite. So <clears throat> find, hike alone, commit yourself to a single overnight, go to a popular place and at the end of the day you can find some solitude, but you won't be alone. And if something goes wrong, you you have no fuel, uh, you don't know how something happens, an animal steals your food, well, whatever. You you'll find help because the hiking community is a fantastic community. Then move up. Then go on a two-day solo hike, and again go on a, on a popular trail. Go do the skyline. The skyline is immensely popular. It's easy to do. So go do the skyline by yourself, and you will never be alone. And then once you've got that mastered, well, then commit yourself after that. Pick the less popular trails. Uh, head out to uh, whatever, the Alexandra River Valley. Head up to uh, House Va v Valley. Do a section of the GDT where it's not popular. And then the next thing you know, you'll be up and running and, and doing solo hikes. So, uh, and I encourage it. I mean, it's discouraged by some people. But boy, there's a huge, huge, huge difference between hiking in a group and hiking solo. They're both fantastic. But um, it, it, I think there's value in experiencing 
nature by yourself. Eric Coleman, Eric, whom you guys know from the hike we did together last year, asked me a question. He said, he asked who my favorite historical figure was. When we were on the trail, we talked a lot about historical figure. For me, it's not politicians. It's absolutely not uh, celebrities or anybody like that. It is, it is either men of science or explorers. And and if I ha because I'm Canadian, if I have to talk about one Canadian explorer in particular, it's David Thompson. I mean the. You know, he left England as a as a young man of 13 or 14, and he had, he signed up. Uh, didn't have much choice, but he was an apprentice with the uh, Hudson's Bay Company, and he owed them, you know, seven years of his life until he's 21, and then he became a partner. But and and he had such a knack for uh, navigating with a sextant and mapping and visualizing things in his mind that he actually mapped one sixth of the North American continent. And, and in my travels, I go to places where he's been and, and I'm just in awe of him. And I guess he represents in general, uh, some of my ancestors, you know, who, 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 um, settled in, in the, in the West and, uh, of North America. So yeah, Eric, that's, uh, my, my favorite historical figure. I'm gonna go with David Thompson. It always helps when the scenery is pretty. It would help more if the sun was out, but can't complain overall. Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, how come you don't always filter your water? And again, it's a basic, I, I for, you know, you can't see right now what I'm, well, you can see, I'm, I'm in the mountains right now. So I got snow and stuff like that, but the, the water here is so darn clean. I mean, it's hitting the mountains here and then it's trickling through and creeks. And by the time it gets to us, it's filtered. It's, it's, it's clean. It's 35 years of experience. I'm not careless. I'm picking clean water from creeks. The, the, the threat of, um, of, um, bear fever or guardia or whatever has been exaggerated you know by companies that sell you filters and things like that I mean people 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 have a fear of uh, actually it's interesting because we're actually going through the COVID-19 pandemic right now and and people are worried about water and beaver fever it's been it's been villainized to the point that people associated with like Ebola and stuff like that which is completely ridiculous so you might get an upset stomach uh, or somebody will argue that that a real beaver fever can give you real uh, long-term problems perhaps but my experience is um, I come out here to connect with the nature and there's no way I'm gonna always filter my water and there's absolutely no way I'm gonna put chemicals in my water Jordan Rouse Visuals asks a really good question. Uh, are there hikes that I consider underrated or overlooked? Uh, I'll give one away, and that's here in this general area in Alberta. It's the uh, Molar Loop. And, and I'll tell you, Molar Loop in particular for me, uh, I, you know, my, my guide for doing hikes in historically was the, uh, you know, the Canadian Rockies trail guide. And, and I went through the trail guide and I pretty much did all the hikes that were in there and I never got around to Molar Pass and, 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 and one day I'm reading the guide and it's nondescript in the guide. And I finally decided, you know what, I'm going to do Molar Pass. And it was absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> And I had a thought when I did it. I thought, you know, uh, Bart Robertson and Brian Patton, who wrote that book, I thought, ah, you buggers. You purposely were nondescript in the book uh, trying to keep this hike to yourselves. I mean, perhaps they were, perhaps they weren't. On the flip side, if you read in their book, they describe the Wabaso Trail. They say only the most sadomasochistic hiker would ever attempt the skyline via the Wabaso. Well, if that's the case, maybe there's a secret there. Maybe they don't want people to go to the Wabaso. Maybe it's gorgeous. But no. So back to your question there, Jordan. Um, yeah, Muller Loop is, uh, is, is not popular. Not, not, you won't find it in a lot of guidebooks. You won't find it being promoted by Parks Canada or anybody else, but it is absolutely, absolutely spectacular. Have you ever thought of turning this into a business? No, absolutely not. 
I did an experiment last year. I invited somebody, and I'll invite people again. You know, it's fun to invite people. It's something I wanted to test, but it definitely confirmed that, no, you know, I don't want to turn hiking into a business. I don't want to turn any hobby into a business. I think uh, a lot of people say that when you turn into a, a hobby into a business, it stops being fun, and I, I firmly believe that. So, no, I have no interest in turning hiking into a, a business. I, I don't even sell merchandise or anything like that. I, I quite honestly do this for the fun of it. Actually... Documenting my hikes on YouTube uh, makes me think a little bit more about the hike and documenting it. And it's kind of fun to have it recorded for prosperity. So. Rory uh, Venucci asked me a, qu a common question, you know, am I afraid of bears and grizzlies in particular? And the, the, the rapid answer to that one is no. I've been doing this for 35 years and I'm not afraid of bears. If I was, uh, I wouldn't be doing it. It's a combination of, of having spent that long in the back country and not having had a significant encounter with bears. I see bears about every second or third hike. And, and I take basic precautions and I have confidence in my ability and carry a bear spray and those those things. Um, and, and whenever I get that question, I always say it's not bears actually that give me the most grief. The most grief I've had with animals over the years by far has been porcupines. I've had some epic battles with porcupines. So much so that if I show up at a campsite and I see evidence of a porcupine, uh, if there's another campsite 5-10 kilometers away, I will absolutely pick up, leave, and go to that other campsite because I hate porcupines. I saw some, you know, I saw something up ahead on the trail, but that bear was so blonde, like cinnamon color. So that's what caught me off guard because as soon as I saw something, I was a little curious. I was like, what is that, you know? Could it be an elk? Because there's a lot of elk around here, or maybe a deer. I mean, it was that color. Literally, it was as blonde as blonde can be. Not even cinnamon. That sucker was blonde. Gorgeous. But I get this question all the time, and, and today we can answer it, or Sarah can answer it herself, because I get a common question, which is, how come we don't see Sarah on the hikes? Because I've been posting hikes now for more than a decade, and people have come to know Karen and uh, Raymond and Nick and Patrick, but how come Sarah doesn't come hiking with us? So what's, what's your thoughts on that, Sarah? What's my thoughts on that? How come you haven't come? It's not really my style. It's not your style? Staying in the bush, um, doing all of those things is not really for me. No? So Maybe a one-day thing one I would day? be willing to start with. but I When you say one day, you mean one overnight? I mean, like, one afternoon. One afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and I would need, like, boots and pants and every single equipment to do those types of things because oh, God, I don't wouldn't. think I can go hiking so the concept with my of, timberland. <laughs> so the concept of uh, hiking, say, 10 kilometers, you get all sweaty, it's all tiring, and at the end of the day, we set up a tent, we have food. It might be a good meal, but then you get to sleep on the ground, maybe on a small, thin mattress. Does that appeal to you? Not really. Not really. <laughs> so I think that's I, the... <laughs> I would do that. I would do that, yeah. but within reason. I mean, I'm not going to hike 100 kilometers in and then spend the night. So that's the basic answer. So Sarah, so there's two fundamental answers why Sarah hasn't come with us. Uh, Sarah, for the last decade or nearly lived in Edmonton and only recently moved back to Calgary. So um, Sarah's uh, independent and living on her own. So we didn't have a lot of opportunities. But the second reason was <laughs> fundamentally she's not interested in that kind of stuff. And neither are the boys anymore, actually. You guys have seen that you see them less and less. Now, that said, Sarah did a very, very, very interesting trip in uh, a few months ago. And she went down to Panama and Colombia. And you did something that it, you that you surprised me. So what was that little adventure? Um, it was a sailboat trip from Panama to Colombia. It was about a five-day trek, and it was interesting, to say the least. <laughs> how big was the sailboat? Uh, 60 feet. 60 feet? With how many people? Uh, I think it was about 20 people. Did so you have a private room? No, no private rooms. <laughs> Bunk beds. Bunk beds. Nowhere to change, nowhere to shower, no shower on the boat whatsoever. So it was very rustic. So, so, so. <laughs> Are you saying that introduced me into hiking? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I think so. Interesting. So there's the answer to that question. 
what's in store for this summer? Uh, well, we'll see what happens with this pandemic if they reopen the parks. Although I know quite a few places where I can go hike on Crown Land that are definitely not restricted. I think the other thing with the parks is that uh, they will, uh, you know, if somebody drops you off, they can't keep you off the trail. But what's in store for me this summer? A couple of things. I I want to redo hikes that I did long ago. Um, one in particular is the South Boundary. I've been wanting to do the, you know, I did the South Boundary in Jasper a long time ago. Part of it is closed now because of a fire and some, some lots of deadfall and people say not to even attempt it. But uh, so I'm going to do a, a variation on the on the uh, South Boundary and I'm just going to head off to uh, do a loop and go visit South Esk Lake and document it. So. I've been on the South Boundary, but I've never been to South Esk in particular, but I've never documented the South Boundary, so I want to do the South Boundary. The other one I just want to go do, I've done it many times, it's uh, it's up in Wilmore Wilderness, you know, the, the Blue Creek, Topaz, Azure, Hard Scrabble part of the world. Um, beautiful, very, very seldom visited area that I want to go visit again. Wandering Bear 81 asked me if I train for my hikes. The answer is, uh no not for hikes specifically but I, I i stay fit um i'm 52 years old but i i think i'm kind of fit i i enjoy uh running well uh, first of all look at where i live i live in the country so in this in uh i have a lot of reasons to go for walks every day and things like that but i actually enjoy running so i do quite a bit of running especially in the summer i, I in my neighborhood i can do about a uh a uh, three kilometer circuit quite easily and I'll do it uh, every day so I uh, try to do about a hundred kilometers of running every month I enjoy running and that's the fundamental way that I stay fit otherwise um, eat healthy and uh, yeah I don't train specifically for my hikes the other thing that I'm lucky for is I get to hike year-round so yeah Darren57 wants to know if I'll attempt the Castlegar Meadows again. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, true true full-blown attempts to get there twice uh, and, and didn't get there. The second time I got so darn close and then uh, my buddy Laurent took some uh, cues off of me and he was able to find it and then he came back and he told me where I had gone wrong. Um, big difference between his hike and mine is that he was with somebody else and he was able to bushwhack the day the sec on my second attempt I was so close to finding the trail but I was bushwhacking and I was breaking my own rule which is if something if I got injured at that point when I was bushwhacking alone somebody wouldn't have known where to look for me so I had to I had to withdraw so that was a day where I couldn't go bushwhacking alone but uh, now that I have a solid idea of where it is plus uh, we found a way to shave a lot of time getting there by using our pack rafts. So absolutely, I will be going to uh, Castle Gar Meadows. Another place that I'll be going back to is the traverse across uh, from Mount Fryett across to Geraldine Lakes via the uh, the the pass, the call between uh, Mount Boulanger and Mount Fryett. And in my last video, as I'm walking up the hill out of breath, I say, you know, I'm enjoying this, and it's and I'm and it's probably the last time I'll ever be there. And when I replay that video once in a while and I see myself saying that, I'm like, no, it's not the last time I'll be there. Never say never. I mean, um, every place is on. There's nothing wrong with re-hiking a trail a second time. Like I've said many times, you, you, if you do it in a different direction, you experience it differently. But no matter what, even if you do it in the exact same direction, every trail gets experienced a different way every time. Whether it's the weather, the people you're with, the food you're eating it's always a different experience so I've learned I used to not want to do the same trail over and over I don't want to do them over and over but if somebody asked me to do a same a trail that I've already done yeah, why not because you can experience it differently but when it comes to Castle Gar, I will go Yeah, one thing I love is uh, I, I don't take an in-reach when I go hiking with me and uh, uh, our national parks don't have cell coverage. I don't take an in-reach. My wife's used to it. I mean, I've been hiking since long before uh, anything remotely resembling an in-reach existed. And uh, I, I don't worry. I plan and I manage my risks. I guess I have a high risk tolerance, but 
uh, it's it, for me it would change everything to have just knowing that I have access to the communication to the external world would change everything and I, I just don't want it I just don't want it I'm, I'd, I'd rather be out there um, and if something happens well so be it I'll deal with it but the the thought of having something that connects me to the civilized world while I'm hiking just doesn't appeal to me asked are you French Canadian and the answer is yes I am absolutely French Canadian so I'm going to switch over to French just to show people uh, mon nom c'est Martin Bélanger je suis né uh, en, en Ontario uh, donc je suis franco-ontarien j'ai un père qui venait de, de l'Ontario et j'ai une mère qui venait du Québec uh, ma mère a rencontré mon père en Ontario parce que ma mère voulait apprendre à parler l'anglais pour devenir bilingue, pour être capable de, de venir au test euh, pour une compagnie aérienne. Finalement, elle s'est mariée, puis elle a eu deux enfants, donc euh, euh, ça a mis fin à sa carrière. Mais euh, donc moi, je suis franco-ontarien. J'ai vécu euh, euh, tout jeune en Ontario. Après ça, on a déménagé au Québec. J'ai passé à peu près 5-6 ans au Québec avant de retourner en Ontario. Un coup en Ontario, j'ai fait mes études universitaires en français à l'Université d'Ottawa. Après ça, euh, un coup que j'ai gradué, j'ai déménagé ici euh, dans l'Ouest canadien, mais euh, par coïncidence, ben pas par coïncidence, par, par le fait que je parle français, j'ai réussi à me trouver un emploi dans les dernières années, euh, dans les trois, quatre dernières années, j'ai travaillé euh, au Québec, j'ai continué de demeurer ici en Alberta, mais j'ai travaillé au Québec pour une pétrolière qui s'appelait Petrolia. Euh, on, travaillait, on avait des, des bureaux à Québec même, à la ville de Québec, mais je travaillais en Gaspésie. Euh, sur l'île d'Anticosti. Euh, finalement, euh, Pétrolier a été racheté par une, euh, une Albertaine qui s'appelait Perry Donc, euh, je, je, je me suis retrouvé euh, à temps plein ici en Alberta. Donc, oui, je suis franco-ontarien. Euh, euh, franco euh, je me considère euh, un bon Canadien qui parle les deux langues officielles, qui est capable de faire un petit feu dans les, dans, dans, dans les bois, qui porte une tuque souvent et, euh, et qui a vécu dans... Pas mal toutes les... bon, en fait, j'ai vécu dans cinq provinces, mais j'ai travaillé dans tous les provinces au Canada. How come we never see my sons? Yeah, that's just um, life. I mean, they're growing up. Uh, both two sons are in university, raised in grade 10, going on 11. Uh, Sarah's back with us, but the, the, the kids all have their own lives, and uh, they don't want to come with me. So, uh, in fact, I'm happy by the fact that they've... Uh, Nick and Patrick both have gone hiking with their girlfriends and friends and uh, taken some of the some of that learnings from me and that passion and I think it's if I look back on my own life I hiked when I was young and then I actually stopped you know uh, when the kids were very young and got you know you go through different chapters in your life you can't keep any it's hard to keep anything going forever I actually had a period in my life where I wasn't hiking a lot and then I started again um, just like I started doing winter camping this year which I hadn't done a lot of before um, you know a lot of things are like that in life I, I'm not golfing these days I used to be a big golfer um, maybe golfing will come back yeah it's just life life you know you can't and actually you can't uh, stay stuck on something in the past you got to prepare for the fact that life goes through waves and cycles and uh, you might enjoy something and slowly your friends drop off and don't do it so you got to be prepared for that and prepared for new challenges and new things so uh, one of the things I look forward to is I hope to buy a, a, a bigger sailboat someday and go do some ocean sailing. I get asked a lot of if I've hiked uh, on Vancouver Island and the West Coast Trail so I think that's an interesting question it, it just shows that the um, I, I think for a lot of the world when you talk about hiking in North America and in Canada, the West Coast Trail comes up, which is very interesting. And no, I've not hiked the West Coast Trail, um, just haven't had the occasion to do it, haven't planned on doing it. Um, I'm sure it's absolutely gorgeous, but it's, uh, it's just never fallen in my bucket list. And, um What's my most memorable hike? Uh, so many, but 
you know, one that comes to mind always is is the north boundary. I mean, the north boundary is not spectacular. You know, it's not an alpine hike, but it's it makes up for it in in the terms of its challenge because you start and end at very far locations, so the logistics are complicated. It's very seldom visited. The season to go there is very short. So I've done the south, uh, the north boundary twice. The last one was super memorable for good reasons and bad reasons. It was memorable because I did it on, you know, just shy of my 50th birthday and wanted to show that I could still hike 100 miles by myself in very remote wilderness. But, but the other reason it was, it was actually miserable. And that, in a sense, makes it uh, more memorable. You know, if every hike was perfect, then you know it wouldn't be any fun it's kind of nice to have some tough hikes once in a while because when you finish it reminds you of the things you enjoy the comforts of home uh last time i did the north boundary it's i think it's evident in the video but i'll just recap it rained and rained and rained i mean midway through there when i was you know nearing the midway mark i had four days of constant rain where i was just looking at the sky and saying come on give me a break so yeah, North Boundary was memorable. Now it's done, baby! Woo! Yeah! We're on the other side of the Athabasca. Let the adventure begin! Woo! Oh yeah, and you guys out there that said you don't like screaming on videos or out in the wilderness? <laughs> Bullshit! Listen to this! Well, if you've watched this far, I consider you a real friend, actually more than a fan. Um, it's been almost—it's been more than 10 years. It's been an amazing experience to do these videos and inter to interact with everybody. I love the comments. Uh, I've said it before about 99% of the comments I receive are overwhelmingly positive. So uh, if you've watched to the end, it's been a great 10 years and hopefully there's another 10 years left in me of, uh, of hiking. Cheers, everyone. There's all these things that I don't think I remember. Hey.